When a person disappears, investigators have an entire set of techniques and tools at their disposal to aid in their investigation. Unfortunately, no matter how expansive their searches may be, and no matter how technologically advanced the methods are, some cases slip through the cracks and go unsolved. Number 10. Kathy Perringer was described as a dedicated and loving mother to her daughter, Kelly. The pair shared a special bond, as for many years it had just been the two of them, save for a couple of boyfriends. Everyone in Kathy's life knew of her devotion to her daughter and how hard she worked to ensure she had a good future ahead of her. When Kathy disappeared from her home one sunny April afternoon, her family immediately sensed something was wrong. In early 1989, Kelly found herself living temporarily in a group home on account of her bad behavior. Kathy hoped the change would be the shock her daughter needed to get back on the straight and narrow, and according to Kelly in a 2021 interview, it was. In April of 1989, Kelly returned to her mother's Riverton, Wyoming home and was happy to be back in her mother's arms. Alongside working a full-time job to provide for herself and her daughter, Kathy had been taking classes at Central Wyoming College. She hoped to show her daughter the importance of a proper education. Her employers and professors described her as a punctual and responsible woman who took her duties seriously. On April 17, 1989, Kelly left the Riverton home and headed off to school. The last memory she has of her mother is watching her standing in the doorway in her bathrobe, waving her off as she walked to the bus stop. What happened between then and the time Kelly finished school remains a mystery. Later that afternoon, Kelly turned her keys in the door, surrounded by a group of small friends, but as she walked inside, she noticed it was eerily silent. She called out for her mother, but she was nowhere to be found. If Kathy intended on being gone for an extended period, she would always leave a note for Kelly, but the kitchen counter was bare. In her interview with the Cowboy State Daily, the second glaringly obvious clue she noticed was the ashtray that sat on the coffee table in the living room. The tray was usually overflowing with cigarette ends, but today it was bare aside from two cigarettes. One of them she knew to be her mother's recognizing the brand, but the other was out of place. In April of 1989, Kathy began hanging around with a new friend, Mr. P. To this day, Kelly believes the other cigarette in the ashtray belonged to Mr. P as he would squish the end of the filter. Hours after Kelly returned home, Mr. P came by, asking for Kathy, as he'd been unable to reach her. Kelly explained that she didn't know where she was either, and bizarrely, Mr. P asked if he could use the phone. According to reports, Mr. P dialed an unknown number and waited for a few seconds before hanging up without leaving a voicemail. In the late evening hours of April 17, 1989, Kelly reported her mother missing to the Riverton Police Department. An initial search was conducted, but no evidence was uncovered. Kathy's car was still in the driveway, and she'd not taken any of her belongings. Unfortunately, Kathy's case would lay dormant for almost a year. It would be her daughter, Kelly, who would unveil a troubling clue about Mr. P. In 1990, Kelly found her mother's diary, in which Kathy described that she and Pac Jr. had been dating for a while. When the Riverton police dug into Pack's background, they discovered he'd been paroled in the mid-1980s following a 14-year prison sentence for aggravated assault and kidnapping. They also found that police forces in Jackson, Wyoming had Pack as a possible suspect in over 30 assault cases. In 2018, Mr. P's DNA linked him to two unsolved assaults. He served a meager four and a half years before being paroled. Mr. P has never been charged or arrested in Kathy's disappearance, and her case remains unsolved. Anyone with information is asked to contact Special Agent Michael Carlson of the Wyoming Division of Criminal Investigation at 307-777-7181, quoting case number 2012-0271, or R10-08888. Number 9. 46-year-old Sherry Marie Wellwood was described as an outgoing and caring woman who was always there to take care of her friends and family. She lived in Hillsboro, Oregon, a city of over 100,000 people. In a big city, it's easy to get lost and feel out of touch with those around you, but Shelley was described as the sort of person who made a sense of community and unity, even in a big city. 
Despite her outgoing personality, Shelley had internal struggles which may have culminated in her disappearance. In late November, Shelley was admitted to a hospital in Portland, Oregon for a psychiatric evaluation and mental health treatment. From articles and reports, it's assumed that Shelley was involuntarily committed. On December 10, 2019, after two weeks of treatment, Shelley was discharged. This would be the last time Shelley was ever seen or heard from. Following her release, Shelley was due to attend an appointment at a walk-in clinic in Portland, but unfortunately she failed to show up. When her friends and family realized she'd missed her appointment and hadn't been seen, they reported her missing to the Hillsborough Police Department. A search of her home was conducted, but no evidence was collected. The only thing Hillsborough Police noted was that Shelley's car was missing. They were now in a race against time to find Shelley, as her friend of 25 years, Michelle, told The Oregon Live she believed her friend to be in the midst of a mental health crisis. Nine days after her discharge, the Josephine County Sheriff's Office contacted the HPD, informing them they'd discovered Shelley's blue 2005 Hyundai Sonata. The car was discovered on Spencer Creek Road in a rural area of Josephine County, with the car being found with an elevation of 4,600 feet. The Oregon Live reported that the car was found under six feet of snow, with a further eight feet piled on top. The engine had idled for some time as the snow under the exhaust had turned black. Inside the car, investigators found a sleeping bag, a tarp, a jacket, leaflets on survival, her wallet, phone, and purse. Receipts inside the car showed Shelley had made two purchases, one on December 10th in Eugene, Oregon, and another on December 11th in Myrtle Creek, Oregon. Shortly before being discharged, Michelle spoke to Shelley pleading with her to stay in the hospital for more treatment. According to Michelle, Shelley immediately shut her down, became angry, and disconnected the call. In Oregon, a person can be committed for a maximum of 180 days, after which a judge must determine whether the person is still a danger to themselves or others. Shelley was held for just two weeks, and it's unknown whether she was given any of her necessary medication upon discharge. Since December 10, 2019, no one has seen or heard from Shelley, and her friends and family believe her to be an extremely vulnerable person due to her mental illness. Anyone with information is asked to contact Detective Megan Townsend of the Hillsborough Police Department at 503-681-6190, quoting case number 2019-20605. Number 8. 29-year-old Loy Gillespie Evitz was described as a kind and conscientious young woman. Those who knew her described her as bright and lively, and knew she was dedicated to her job as a secretary at a local law firm. Loy was also happily married, with the pair excited to share their future together. So when she disappeared mysteriously during her lunch break, everyone knew that something was very wrong. In 1973, Loy married Donald Evitz, the two hit it off from the moment they met and were overjoyed to be wed. They breezed through the honeymoon period and enjoyed the stereotypical wedded bliss right into 1977. Loy had a comfortable position as a secretary at a law firm in downtown Kansas City, Missouri, and everything in her life seemed perfect. On February 28, 1977, Loy arrived at work bright and early, ready to read through the messages and sort through her tasks for the day. At 3 p.m., Loy left the office, telling her co-workers she was headed out for her lunch hour. She walked down the stairwell of the building and into the parking garage, where she got into her yellow MG sports car and drove down the road. When 4 p.m. came around and there was no sign of Loy, her co-workers became concerned. Loy was extremely dedicated to her job and would have likely called if there was a problem. They assumed she was taking extra time back after having worked long hours the week before, but by 4.30 p.m., their concern grew further. Equally, Donald Evitz was worried when his wife hadn't returned by 6 p.m. that evening. Donald called the law firm where Loy worked and learned the awful news. They hadn't seen her since she'd taken her lunch hour. In a fit of panic, Donald hopped into his car and drove to Loy's office. Her bright yellow MG was in its usual parking spot in the parking garage, but she was nowhere to be found. Upon discovering this, Donald called the Kansas City Police Department and reported his wife missing. The Kansas City PD were quick to respond and met Donald at the law firm. 
Inside Loy's car, they found an umbrella and a few items. After canvassing the area, they learned Loy had last been seen on the Country Club Plaza, Main Street, and Westport Road after 3 p.m. that afternoon. These locations were a mere four blocks from Loy's workplace, and it was clear she'd used her lunch break to run a few errands. One shop owner confirmed she'd purchased an umbrella that afternoon, which was found on the front seat of her car, further compounding this notion. Investigators were stunned. Loy had driven her car back to the parking garage but had never made it to her office. So what had happened? Nobody in the complex reported hearing screams or a struggle. So had she gone willingly with someone? Had it been someone she trusted? As there was little evidence, the Kansas City Police Department was at a loss, and her case quickly grew cold. Around 10 days after she disappeared, her purse and other items were found discarded under a bridge near Unity Village in the southeast of Kansas City. It's unknown if any forensic evidence had been obtained from these in the years since her disappearance. In March of 1977, an unnamed 34-year-old man from Grandview, Missouri, was arrested for kidnapping Loy, but these charges were dropped days after. When questioned, the Kansas City Police Department stated this was due to a lack of evidence. Since 1977, there's been no movement in Loy's case. Her husband was quickly ruled out, and the pair were not experiencing any difficulties in their marriage. Everyone at the law office and complex was forthcoming, and police have no suspects or evidence. In 1984, Loy was declared deceased in absence, and since then, her case has flown under the radar. Anyone with information is asked to contact the Kansas City Police Department at 816-234-5136, quoting case number 00J81177. Number 7. 50-year-old Deborah Elizabeth Puente was described as a determined and outgoing woman by those who knew her best. Deborah was also known for her kindness, which extended to those not just in her inner circle. In March of 2017, Deborah disappeared without a trace, sending her family on a years-long hunt for justice and the truth. In 2017, 50-year-old Deborah resided in Linda Vista, California, with her boyfriend and his brother, both of whom have remained unnamed. She also had children from a previous relationship, whom she's said to have been extremely protective of. As her relationship was blossoming, so too was her career. She'd worked with her company for over 15 years and was extremely proud of how far she'd risen. On March 28, 2017, Deborah arrived at work in a sullen mood. She and her boyfriend had been arguing and she was looking to blow off some steam. When the workday was over, she and a few friends decided to hit a few bars so that they could talk and relax. By 11 p.m., the night was winding down, with Deborah telling her friends she wanted to drive around town for a bit. She also mentioned this was to give her boyfriend enough time to leave the house before she got in, to spare another argument. According to Deborah's friends, they last saw her sometime between 10 and 11 p.m., leaving the Longhorn Bar and Grill on Mission Gorge Road in San Diego, California in her black 2013 Hyundai. This was the last time Deborah was ever seen or heard from again. When Deborah's boyfriend didn't hear from her on March 29th, he assumed that she didn't want to talk to him. But as the days went on, he became concerned. When he failed to reach her and learned that she had failed to show up for work, he contacted the San Diego Police Department to report her missing. Deborah's family and friends knew she would never have intentionally missed work, as she didn't want to jeopardize her career. Searches were conducted, but no sign of her was found. It wasn't until days later, on April 5th, that her black 2013 Hyundai was discovered abandoned in Ocean Beach, California. According to reports, the car was found illegally parked at the 5000 block of Santa Cruz Avenue, which is a dead-end road overlooking cliffs. The San Diego police were called to the scene, and inside the car, they found Deborah's wallet, keys, ID, shoes, and socks. The items had been locked inside of the car, but there's no mention of her phone in these reports. Investigators also discovered that she'd recently received a parking ticket as early as 6 a.m. on March 29th. Unfortunately, since this discovery, there have been no more leads in Deborah's case. Her boyfriend was considered a suspect as the pair had argued the night she disappeared, but he was quickly cleared. On their Facebook page, Deborah's family states that it's extremely out of character for Deborah to abandon her children and her other responsibilities. 
anyone with information is asked to contact Detective Anna Glazowski of the San Diego Police Department at 619-531-2000, quoting case number 1701313. Number 6. Life for 22-year-old Chelsea Michelle Cobo of New York City had not always been smooth sailing. As a child, she'd been legally adopted by her Aunt Rose after her parents were unable to take care of her. Life with her aunt was comfortable and happy, but it seemed that, like her parents, Chelsea too suffered from mental health issues. In May of 2016, Chelsea checked herself into rehab to help set her life straight, but just days later, she disappeared from treatment without a cause. In March of 2016, Chelsea suffered a devastating blow when her biological mother passed away. Despite being raised by her Aunt Rose, Chelsea had maintained contact with her mother, and the pair had a close bond. The passing of her mother had a profound impact on her mental health, and shortly after, she admitted herself into psychiatric care. Under the proper care and treatment, Chelsea began to feel better again, and after two weeks, she was well enough to be released. Back at home with her Aunt Rose, Chelsea described how she'd made two new good friends while receiving inpatient treatment. Mrs. X had been Chelsea's roommate during her stay, and the pair had bonded over similar interests. She also told her aunt that during her stay, Miss X had a regular male visitor named Justice, and they too had built up a close friendship. Rose was excited for Chelsea and hoped these new friendships would bring Chelsea some much-needed joy and security. Soon after leaving treatment, though, Chelsea began to feel unwell again. In April of 2016, she returned to her aunt's apartment after a night on the town. It was later revealed that on this occasion, Chelsea had been assaulted, robbed, and spiked. She recalled to the police that she couldn't remember which club she'd been in, nor whom she'd been with at the time. This incident sent Chelsea's mental health issues spiraling once more. Rose tried to help her, but as the weeks passed, it became clear she required medical intervention. By May of 2016, Chelsea agreed with her aunt, and on May 6th, she asked Rose to drive her to the local hospital. From here, a transport van would collect Chelsea to take her to a rehab center in Yonkers, New York. That afternoon, the pair shared a tearful goodbye, but Rose had no idea it would be the last time she would ever see or hear from Chelsea. Days passed without word from Chelsea, and Rose began to worry. She called the rehabilitation center and was horrified to learn that Chelsea was not in their care. Panicked, Rose called the New York Police Department to report her missing. After conducting a thorough search of the rehab center and the hospital where Chelsea had departed from, the NYPD began talking to Chelsea's friends and family. Rose had mentioned Justice and Mrs. X to the NYPD, and after talking to Justice, the NYPD gained their first clue. Justice told investigators that during her trip, Chelsea had been texting friends, asking them to come and pick her up. He then went on to claim that on the evening of May 6th, he drove to Yonkers, picked Chelsea up, and dropped her off on 68th Street in Brooklyn. Interestingly, some reports do place Chelsea and Justice and another man at the Florida Club in the early hours of May 7th, 2016, but it's unclear if these reports have been validated by CCTV or other evidence. Since mid-2016, the NYPD has not uncovered any new evidence or received any further witness sightings. Chelsea's case has quickly hit a brick wall and has not received widespread media attention. Anyone with information is asked to contact the New York Police Department at 212-694-7781, quoting case number KNMP3948. Number 5. 20-year-old Sandra B. Bertolas, lovingly known as Sandy, was described as an intelligent and hard-working young woman. Sandy had grown up as the youngest of eight in Menominee Falls, Wisconsin, and had big dreams of one day moving to New York City to carve out her dreams. Unfortunately, the bright future would be snatched away from her one April afternoon in 1988. From an early age, Sandy's parents had instilled the virtues of hard work and determination into her. In 1988, at age 20, Sandy had long lived up to those ideals instilled into her. She'd taken on not one, but two huge responsibilities. She worked part-time as a beautician at a hair salon, while also studying towards a degree in business and marketing. 
Sandy juggled her responsibilities with ease and even had time for a social life and a boyfriend. On April 24th, 1988, Sandy attended a bridal shower where she would talk to her friends about her boyfriend, who's never been named, and it wasn't good. She revealed during the gathering that her boyfriend had given her a fake surname and a fake address. To add insult to injury, she had also discovered that he was cheating on her. She wasn't finished though, and just as chatter filled the air, she dropped another bombshell. She was pregnant. Her friends implored her to confront her boyfriend about his lies and tell him that she was pregnant. Spurred on by her friends, Sandy left the family home at 8.15 p.m. that evening after agreeing to meet with her boyfriend. According to reports, the boyfriend had called her several times that day, begging to meet with her and explain himself. At first, Sandy was hesitant, as she didn't have enough gas or money to fill up her tank. Desperate to see her, her boyfriend offered to pay for the gas, which was enough to sway Sandy. Eventually, she left her home at 8.15 to confront him face to face. The next morning, the Bertola's family home seemed quiet, and that's when Sandy's parents realized she'd failed to return home. Sandy had never stayed out without telling her parents where she was going, and they were instantly concerned. Her parents promptly reported her missing to the Menominee Falls Police Department, who began their search right away. Their first port of call was Sandy's boyfriend, who claimed to have not met up with her on the night of April 24th. He did admit to having called her several times but denied that there was any meeting. He also told police he had no idea that she was pregnant. After this failed lead, investigators began searching the town for any signs of her. It wasn't until three days after Sandy disappeared that they would gain their first clue. In the parking lot of the Red Carpet Lanes Bowling Alley, located on West Lapham Street, was Sandy's white SUV. Unfortunately, nobody at the alley knew how long the car had been parked there and nothing of note was inside. After discovering Sandy's car, investigators went back to her boyfriend, but this time he refused to speak with them. As they had no evidence against him, they were unable to move forward with any charges. The only other clue in Sandy's case came in the form of a napkin found in her room, which had the address of the Mount Olive Cemetery in Milwaukee written on it. As this was their only viable lead, investigators dug deeper and began a physical search of the cemetery. According to the Charlie Project, canine dogs were dispatched to the area and they picked up on Sandy's scent, but nothing further came of this. While digging through records and information about the cemetery, investigators learned that not only had Sandy's boyfriend worked there previously, but that his father was a current employee. Investigators wondered whether this was the designated meeting spot the pair had agreed upon on April 24th. Unfortunately, they were unable to obtain this information from the boyfriend as he'd shut down all lines of communication with the police. Since then, Sandy's case has sat cold. In 2002, there was a glimmer of hope when state prosecutors conducted a John Doe probe where over 50 witnesses testified. But after 21 months, the probe ended with no charges being filed. The Menominee Falls police believe Sandy met with foul play, but without any solid evidence, there's little they can do. Anyone with information is asked to contact the Menominee Falls Police Department at 262-532-8700, quoting case number I-881528. Number 4. 28-year-old Terry Slogenhop was a young woman full of promise and hope. Those close to her described her as bright and entertaining, she shared a close bond with her brother. While her relationship with her mother is described as strained, Terry always ensured to call and visit her as much as possible. So when the call stopped in early 1991, her family knew something was amiss. By 1991, Terry was living with a roommate in an apartment in the 1400 block of North St. Clair Street in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Terry and her roommate discussed how they enjoyed their independence away from their families and pondered what their future lives and careers had in store for them. Terry had grown up with her mother and brother in Aspenwall, Pennsylvania, a small town of around 2,900 people, eight miles outside of Pittsburgh. As a child and teenager, Terry attended Fox Chapel Area High School, where she excelled as a student, but during her later years, she fell into a spiral. According to her mother, in around 10th grade, Terry began abusing alcohol and entered rehab. Following her stint in rehab, Terry seemed to have gotten better but was known to have relapsed a few times. 
After graduating high school, Terry moved into the big city to pursue job opportunities and get a fresh start. By 1991, Terry had found a roommate and was carving out a future for herself. She maintained contact with her mother and brother, visiting them both during the holidays and birthdays. On January 6, 1991, just as the celebrations of the new year were dwindling, Terry awoke in a good mood and had great news to share with her roommate. That evening, she had a date planned and she was excited at the prospect of him being Mr. Right. According to her roommate, the date went as planned, with Terry returning to their shared apartment at 10 p.m. It seemed that Terry had more good news for her roommate, as the following day, on January 7th, a man was going to come by the apartment to take her on an important job interview. Her roommate assumed that Terry would want to get a good night's rest before the interview, but before heading to bed, Terry remarked that she was going to run to a nearby store to make a call. Unfortunately, this was the last time Terry was ever seen or heard from again. Terry never made it back to her apartment and never showed up for the job interview. The first time that Terry's family realized anything was wrong was on January 8, 1991, when she failed to arrive at her brother's home. After contacting her roommate, her family learned that she hadn't been seen since the evening of January 6. Her family reported her missing to the Pittsburgh Police Department, but since then there's been little information in her case. Searches of her apartment and the surrounding areas were conducted, but no evidence has ever been collected. To this day, investigators don't know who Terry called or what the call was about. In 2017, it was reported that the Pittsburgh Police Department had collected DNA from Terry's family and that her family had traveled to Kentucky, Louisiana, and Indiana and beyond to see if unidentified remains were that of their missing daughter. But so far, nothing has come of these efforts. Some reports indicate that before heading out to the store, Terry received a call, although the validity of this statement is unknown. If still alive today, Terry Sloggenhop would be 61 years old. Anyone with information is asked to contact Detective Joseph Gannon of the Pittsburgh Police Department at 412-323-7800, quoting case number 9111005. Number 3. When a clump of brown human hair was found in the Chautauqua Lake in New York, the Lakewood Busty Police Department believed they may have finally had a breakthrough in one of their most troubling missing person cases to date, the disappearance of Lori Ceci Bova. Unfortunately, the hair was determined as not belonging to her, and ever since, her case has sat unanswered. By 1997, 26-year-old Lori Bova and Mr. Bova had been married for a few years. While the first few years are meant to be filled with marital bliss, it appears that their marriage was anything but. On June 7, 1997, Lori and Mr. Bova went on a dinner date with Lori's sister to the Red Lobster restaurant in Lakewood, New York. The dinner went well, with the pair returning home sometime after 10.30. Away from the guise of Lori's sister, Mr. Bova told investigators that the pair got into an argument, although the reason for their argument has never been disclosed. The argument continued until the early morning hours of June 8th. According to Mr. Bova, the last time he ever saw his wife was as she was stepping out of their apartment at 2 a.m. to smoke a cigarette. Hours later, Mr. Bova realized his wife was missing from what should have been a quick trip and immediately called her family. According to reports, they banded together and drove around the town looking for any sign of Lori. After several hours had passed and they'd found nothing, they reported her missing to the Lakewood Busty Police Department. Likewise, the LBPD searched around town for Lori, as well as searching her apartment. Despite the wide-scale searches that were undertaken, as of 2024, no sign of Lori has ever been uncovered. A small glimmer of hope came when a clump of long brown hair was found floating in the aforementioned lake. But following weeks of analysis, it was discovered that the hair did not belong to Lori, and investigators were back at square one. When Lori left her Lakewood apartment, she didn't take her handbag, purse, money, or ID. From the get-go, Mr. Bova refused to cooperate with investigators, casting a shadow of suspicion on him. In 2018, he passed away following a car accident, and investigators lost their only witness. Since then, there have been no new leads, and Lori's family hopes that one day they will learn the truth of what happened to her. Anyone with information is asked to contact the Lakewood Busty Police Department at 716-763-9563.
Quoting case number AJAM00951. Number 2. 24-year-old Christopher Ray Dutad was regarded as a bright and intelligent young man who enjoyed hunting, fishing, and working on cars. In February of 2013, Christopher and his girlfriend, Mrs. Z, were assaulted in their Vinton, Virginia home. Months later, Chris had testified at the trial of one of his attackers and was due to testify against the second. Just before the trial could take place, Chris would disappear under bizarre circumstances. In February of 2013, Chris and his girlfriend lived through a terrifying experience when their home on Kingston Road in Vinton, Virginia was broken into. The couple, who had two young children in the house, immediately worried for their safety and did all they could to protect them. According to reports, Chris and his girlfriend were assaulted during the break-in, leading to them both sustaining injuries. Reports also indicate that the break-in was carried out by an acquaintance and his brother, although it's not known whether the attackers knew one or both of the couple. Following this, Chris was called up to testify against the first of his attackers, which led to him being found guilty. Sometime after the first trial, Chris and Mrs. Z broke off the relationship and were in the process of carving up custody. By October of 2013, communication had broken down and the pair were now taking the matter to court for a judge to decide. Mrs. Z is also said to have taken out an order of protection against Chris during this time. On October 25th, 2013, Chris finished work as usual before heading to a local store to cash his paycheck. Reports indicate that at around 4.30 p.m., Chris was dropped off at Chaps Tavern in Roanoke, Virginia to spend the afternoon relaxing. Chris spent around four hours in the bar, relaxing and chatting with other patrons that he knew. Sometime around 8 p.m., Chris left on foot, presumably heading home to get rest before work the next day. This would be the last time Chris was ever seen or heard from. Bizarrely, Chris spent his afternoon in the bar when, according to a friend, they had plans to meet at a local grocery store at 5 p.m. When Chris failed to return home or show up for work the next day, he was reported missing, and the Virginia State Police quickly became involved in his case. October 28, 2013 was due to be the date of Chris's custody hearing, but he was absent. Shortly after his disappearance, he'd also been due to testify against the second assailant in the February 2013 attack. Unfortunately, leads in Chris's case quickly dried up. Despite extensive efforts made by both the police and Chris's family, on February 22, 2024, the Franklin County Circuit Court declared Chris deceased in absence. But his ruling does not mean that his case is solved. Investigators and Chris's family believe his disappearance and the timing are highly suspicious, but there's no evidence to guide them in making any arrests or convictions. If still alive today, Christopher Ray Dutad would be 35 years old. Anyone with information is asked to contact Special Agent Douglas Hubert of the Virginia State Police at 540-375-9500, quoting case number 18-1161. Number 1. 21-year-old Larissa Lone Hill was described as a bright and happy young woman who was devoted to her daughter. Larissa lived on the vast Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota, where she was close to her parents and many of her eight siblings. Despite personal issues, Larissa always ensured to fulfill her duties as a mother and would always keep in contact with her family. In 2014, Larissa discovered that she was pregnant and was overjoyed at the prospect of becoming a mother. Unfortunately, during this time, Larissa fell into the wrong circles and began using substances once her child was born. Realizing that she was not in the position to be a mother, Larissa handed over custody of her daughter to her father's family. Despite her decision, Larissa would visit her daughter several times a week. She would either hike at the vast Pine Ridge Indian Reservation to get there, or would even hitchhike, a practice her family warned her against. In 2016, Larissa moved 100 miles away from the reservation to Rapid City, South Dakota to live with her older sister, Carol. Unfortunately, the move didn't last long, and in early October of 2016, following an argument, Larissa was asked to move out. On October 2, 2016, Larissa made what would be the final visit to her mother's house on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. During this meeting, Larissa discussed her argument with her sister. Her mother advised her to apologize and see if her sister would have her back. A few hours later, Larissa told her mother that her boyfriend and a female friend were on their way to pick her up. 
She detailed their plans, stating that they were going to visit the local mall and hang out on the reservation. This was the last time Lisa Lone Hill saw her daughter alive. In the early morning hours of October 3rd, 2016, Larissa sent her final text message to her cousin, letting them know that she and two male friends were heading out to a party in Rapid City. When Larissa didn't return home, her family were alarmed. This alarm turned to panic when Larissa's boyfriend called them, explaining he'd been unable to contact her since October 3rd. Larissa's family then made the heartbreaking decision to report her missing to the Rapid City Police Department. According to Larissa's family, due to her being indigenous and having a troubled history, law enforcement paid little attention to her case. The two men Larissa was reportedly last seen with were interviewed, with them telling investigators that they dropped her off and hadn't seen her since. Since 2016, there's been little movement in Larissa's case, and her cases failed to garner mainstream attention. Larissa is just one of hundreds of indigenous women who've disappeared under bizarre circumstances in a phenomenon dubbed MMIWG. Since her disappearance, investigators have stated that they believe Larissa met with foul play, but without evidence or her body, they're unable to move forward in her case. Anyone with information is asked to contact the Rapid City Police Department at 605-394-4131, quoting case number 2016-216-159. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to hit that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.